Well, we can get started. I said I'd keep it light today, and I will. And I know uh, in some places today's a holiday now, <laughs> not here in Nevada. But it is the day after the Super Bowl, and a lot of people uh, get together for that. It's sort of a modern secular holiday, but we do have class today. So today we're going to talk about the Federal Wire Act. Again, we've talked about a lot of, uh, you know, sort of the basics. We've gone over the basics quite a bit. We've talked about sort of the overview of Indian gaming law. But let's start talking about the Federal Wire Act and federal statutes that directly impact gambling. So, you know, in the late 40s, you know, the United States went into to, to World War II in the, in the 40s. And it was one significant nation among many. It was primarily an isolationist nation. We had the 19th largest army in the world, ahead of Bulgaria, but behind Portugal. Uh, we had the second largest Navy, but it was divided between two oceans and featured a lot of really antiquated hardware, a lot of old ships. And US air power really lagged behind other countries. Uh, the United States was just at the beginning of World War II. We, you know, most of our, our airplanes, uh, combat airplanes were first generation monoplanes. Uh, in fact, I think the Navy's primary fighter at the time was modified from its original biplane design to a single wing design. So, you know, the United States certainly wasn't prepared to go to war uh, for, at the beginning of World War II. You know, again, we were isolationists. Roosevelt was elected on an isolationist platform, at least in large part. But we did get involved in World War II. And when World War II ended, uh, we were in a different position. <laughs> we were the world's first nuclear superpower, definitely had the largest and most modern Navy in the world, had one of the best equipped armies in the world, had the largest strategic bombing corps and really sophisticated piston aircraft uh, for fighters and things like that. And so the United States really transformed itself during World War II. But there were threats that remained. And those threats, anybody have any, any idea of what uh, the big threats of the, of the late 40s, early 50s were? Courtney? Um, like the Soviet Union and the Cold War, perhaps? Yeah, the beginning of the Cold War. So communism, big worry, big threat. And then organized crime was the other big threat. So coming out of World War II, we're this really strong nation, but you know, two threats to the American way of life you know, are, are clear and present and are incredibly dangerous. That's communism and organized crime. Well, Senator McCarthy from Appleton, Wisconsin kind of had that communism thing like uh, cornered. And so others decided to jump on the, the, uh, the organized crime issue. Let's take a little look at uh, some newsreels from that time. So you really got to kind of go back in time. Back to before the Wire Act was actually enacted. Communism, organized crime were threats, major threats. <laughs> The Senatorial Committee investigating crime in New York sets the stage for a new drama on its final day. Again, Frank Costello, alleged gambling czar, is the target for grilling. Again, he refuses to divulge his wealth. On the subject of his duties as a citizen, Senator Toby has searching questions. What have you ever done for your country as a good citizen? Well, I don't know what you... What you mean by that? Well, you're looking back over the oh, years yeah. now to that time when you became a citizen, and you're now standing 20 odd years after that. 
You must have in your mind some things you've done that you can speak of to your credit as American citizens. If so, what are they? Paid my tax. The Senate Crime Investigation Committee shifts its operations to Washington, where Attorney General J. Howard McGrath is among the witnesses. He urgently recommends new legislation to curb interstate gambling information. He is followed to the stand by J. Edgar Hoover, chief of the FBI, who makes an eloquent plea for stronger law enforcement at the local level, where he says the real evil lies. So you can kind of get an idea of what things were like then. And those were scenes from the Kefauver Commission. Now, Estes Kefauver was a junior senator from uh, Tennessee. And in the 1950s, he had his eye on higher office. Now, again, back in the 1950s, we didn't have the same kind of primary system we do today for president, the two major political parties. And the parties chose their presidential and vice presidential nominees at a convention, but the Conventioners didn't need to follow the primary votes. You know, if, if states had primaries, it, it, it was it was informative, but not really uh, adhered to. So Kefauver really needed to make an impact, and what he decided to do was hold these senatorial commission meetings on organized crime on television. Now, again, in the 1950s, television's relatively new. And people are just starting to get television sets. And places like bars and restaurants are starting to get television sets. Again, pre-cable, everything's over the air. And he holds these hearings where he brings major mobsters in front of the American public Oh, and by the way, they're at prime time, prime viewing time. And it becomes the must-see TV of the 1950s. Now, that Frank Costello clip you saw, uh, the reason the crowd was laughing was because he finally was answering questions. You know, prior to that, for days, he kept pleading the fifth. He pleaded the fifth with regard to confirming his name. And... At one point, he gets upset. He gets kind of fed up with the committee and or the commission, and he decides to just walk out. And they charge him with contempt. And they said if he doesn't answer some questions, they're going to charge him with contempt. That's when he's brought back in, and that question gets gets asked. So he had been frustrating the commission for days, and finally he answers some questions, and, and that was his answer. And the crowd laughed and. This really was impactful. It's kind of hard to describe how impactful these hearings were and how popular they were. Um, probably the best thing to do is show you another video that kind of puts this all into context. Hopefully this will work. I don't know if anybody watches the history guy or not, but worth watching. On a lot of topics. Americans became familiar with the violence of organized crime during the bootlegger and prohibition era, but most Americans had no idea the true extent of mob crime until, well, after the Second World War. In 1950, a freshman U.S. Senator, Estes Kefauver, took on organized crime at the head of a special committee. The so-called Kefauver hearings were held in major cities across the country, and the ones that were televised live became a sensation in the first place that many Americans came face to face with the mob. It is history that deserves to be remembered. Organized crime began in large American cities like New York, often in marginalized ethnic neighborhoods. Many of them began as locally focused street gangs that expanded to organizations that acted citywide and later even nationwide. Of course, it's well known that prohibition provided fertile ground for what became the largest crime syndicates who used bootlegging in illegal bars to make fortunes. Some powerful gangs formed within Sicilian communities and integrated members of the Italian mafia fleeing Mussolini's Italy. Violence became endemic as the games fought over territory and supplies, bringing rise to famous mobsters like Al Capone. 
in New York, the fighting culminated in Charles Lucky Luciano creating the commission to lead, govern, and protect the interests of sanctioned crime families. When prohibition ended, the families moved into new industries, including criminal enterprises like gambling, labor racketeering, extortion, and drug trafficking. They supported gambling as a legal enterprise in Nevada and Las Vegas and used huge sums of money to quietly bribe and evade local police departments and judges, which had neither the knowledge nor the resources to combat the well-organized cross-state criminal enterprises. In 1949, stories about organized crime started to appear prominently in American newspapers. Crime commissions in cities like Chicago reported that there was corruption among local officials. The American Municipal Association, which represented some 10,000 cities and towns, petitioned the government to do something about organized crime. While Democrat Estes Keefauver was only in his first term as a senator representing Tennessee, he had been in the House of Representatives since 1939 and had conspicuously supported President Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal. Kefauver had run against the Democratic machine in Tennessee, run by E.H. Crump. He answered the growing call for action by drafting a resolution to allow the Senate Judiciary Committee to investigate organized crimes activities in relation to interstate commerce. This caused a problem because the Senate Committee on Interstate and Foreign Commerce claimed jurisdiction. Eventually, a compromise resolution was introduced that would create a special committee of five senators that drew from both committees. Still, some senators opposed the committee as it was against the spirit of the Legislative Reorganization Act of 1946, which had nearly eliminated special committees altogether. Opposition was so strong that the vote was tied, and Vice President Alvin Barkley cast the tie-breaking vote to establish the committee. The Special Committee to Investigate Organized Crime and Interstate Commerce was tasked with investigating whether organized crime utilizes the facilities of interstate commerce or otherwise operates in interstate commerce. And if so, who or what kind of organization was responsible? Kefauver was made the committee chairman, which led to the committee being popularly called the Kefauver Committee. Barkley also chose the remaining members, Herbert O'Connor, Maryland, Lester Hunt, Wyoming, Alexander Wiley, Wisconsin, and Charles Toby of New Hampshire. Kefauver directed the committee to focus its efforts on what he called the lifeblood of organized crime, interstate gambling. Kefauver promised to lead a no stone unturned, no holds barred, right down the middle of the road, let the chips fall where they may investigation, no matter the political fallout. The first hearing was held in Miami on May 28, 1950. Almost immediately, they found gambling everywhere, openly and notoriously, and apparently with the full knowledge of the entire community. In the committee's report, they reported that law enforcement incredibly claimed they didn't know anything about gambling activity. Known gangsters from states as far away as New York, Pennsylvania, and Michigan had headquarters at hotels in Miami. Kefauver concluded that the sheriff of Dade County had done nothing to enforce the Florida laws, and several members of his staff testified to corruption within the office. The sheriff of Broward County got most of his income from a business which ran gambling activities. Many gangsters and witnesses refused to appear at all, which the report said, is strongly indicative of an admission of guilt. Perhaps most shockingly, the investigation traced connections between gambling businesses and contributions made to Florida Governor Fuller Warren. Affirming his commitment to a no hold barred investigation, Kefauver reported the information even though Warren was in his party. Warren said Kefauver was an ambition-crazed Caesar who was trying desperately and futilely to become president. The governor refused to appear before the committee, citing the state's rights but his political career was over. The hearings went on for 15 months when the committee was set to expire in February 1951. Public outcry led to it being extended until September. Hearings were held in 14 cities from New York to Chicago to Los Angeles. And everywhere the committee went, they found evidence of mob activity, uncooperative witnesses, and official corruption. Kefauver described Kansas City as a place that was struggling out from under the rule of law in the jungle. The investigation in Missouri uncovered mob support for Governor Forrest Smith. Mobster Charlie Benaggio had helped to elect the governor, hoping to open up the state. One of the most important resources for many gangs was control of race wires. Originally envisioned by John Payne, a former telegraph operator for Western Union, they were telegraph services that specifically sent coded reports of horse racing and other kinds of betting. These wires were controlled completely by the mob. Many learned that in Miami, the wires were controlled by the Capone gang, while Benjamin Bugsy Siegel controlled them in Las Vegas. Siegel was murdered. While the case remains unsolved, it may have been something to do with his control of the race wires. These wire services charged establishments and bookies to receive the results or cut off access to the results. 
the Chicago investigation implicated many public officials in mob schemes and corrupt practices, which helped to sink Chicago representative and House Majority Leader Scott Lucas's campaign, resulting in defeat in November. At the time, fellow senators were dismissive of the committee. One senator metaphorically rolled his eyes when Kefauver's absence was noted. He isn't here. He's out chasing them crap shooters. A Washington Post columnist said, it's like investigating sin in the common cold, perennial evils, which through the centuries have proven fairly invulnerable to law. But Kefauver had faith in one of the things that would become one of the committee's greatest strengths, television. He wrote, television gives the public a third dimension that helps to interpret what is actually going on. And his faith was well placed. When the committee started airing live in January of 1951, no complaint by the witnesses about their privacy could stop the hearings from becoming a juggernaut of public attention. When Missouri betting commissioner James Carroll refused to testify, saying, I do not expect to be made an object of ridicule, Kefauver answered that he would not permit the arrangements of this hearing to be dictated by a witness. Television was still a fairly new technology, and fewer than half of their homes had a television. Many of those who didn't have one watched the hearings in bars, restaurants, and businesses, and they even played in some movie theaters. In March, 20 to 30 million people watched the New York hearings. In 1950, there wasn't enough programming to fill the schedules of even a handful of channels. Primetime had good coverage, but there was often nothing at all on during the day. The key five hearings provided some riveting content. Time Magazine helped sponsor the hearings in New York and Washington, D.C., promoting magazine subscriptions. The hearings were a hit, as Life Magazine noted, looking at millions of frosty screens, people sat as if charmed. Never before had the attention of the nation been riveted so completely on a single matter. U.S. adjusted itself to Kefauver's schedule. Dishes stood in sinks, babies went unfed, business sagged, and department stores emptied. When the hearings were on, said Time Magazine, in the middle of it all was Senator Kefauver, warning about a sinister criminal organization that worked in America's cities. Possibly the biggest draw of the televised hearings was the cast of characters the committee interrogated, criminals as suave and well-mannered as their investigators. The mobsters looked like they had stepped right out of a crime movie, well-dressed and belligerent, while corrupt officials were rattled by the questioning. In L.A., gangster Mickey Cohen, when after he had surrounded himself with acts of violence, responded, I've not murdered anybody. All the shooting has been done at me. In New Orleans, when Sheriff admitted on television that he had a safe in his bedroom with ten or $15,000, Look here, all this is gonna go over the radio and this television. You're just inviting burglars, the sheriff worried. There's quite a few burglars around here, the committee council agreed. <laughs> Others seem to develop amnesia or plead the fifth, their constitutional right not to incriminate themselves in their own testimony. When they arrived in Las Vegas, many of the high profile casino owners had simply skipped town. In St. Louis, bars are said to have done better business than they did during the World Series. In Los Angeles and San Francisco, the hearings uncovered illegal payouts and mob activity and drew some of the largest audiences then recorded for daytime television. The committee questioned a number of important mob figures like Tony Accardo, Joe Adonis, gangsters with nicknames like The Waiter, Little New York, and Greasy Thumb Guzik. By far the greatest drama of the hearing came during the eight days the committee spent in New York City in March 1951. Frank Costello, said to be a key mob figure in gambling syndicates, drew enormous attention. His carefully coiffed hair and tailored suits would help to define the image of the Italian-American mobster. Costello refused at first to testify because microphones were prevented from conferring privately with his lawyer, but a compromise was made that the live broadcast would focus only on Costello's hands, which twisted and clenched, revealing inner fears and confusion. Costello quickly bowed to the pressure of the question, refusing to answer and becoming belligerent and even mumbling incoherently. In one appearance, he abruptly announced he was sick and walked out of the courtroom. He was cited for contempt, and he served prison time for it. Though the committee hadn't proven many of the allegations against him, they won a ring endorsement from the public, who saw Costello as a kind of living embodiment of the mob. Another highlight was the testimony of Virginia Hill Hauser, once a girlfriend of Bugsy Siegel. She came to the testimony dressed in a mink cape, suede gloves, and a huge hat. She arrived late and described in a whiny voice how she had met some fellas at the Chicago World's Fair in 1933, where she had been slinging hash. She said she was given gifts by some of the fellows, but that she knew nothing about any illegal activity. She backtalked the committee and had a considerable color to the show, explaining she had had a fight with Siegel because she hit a girl at the hotel and he told me I wasn't a lady. When she left, she belted one reporter and kicked another. The reporting words to the press were, I hope the atom bomb falls on every one of you. Not long after, she fled the country to avoid a tax evasion charge from the IRS. 
the hearings continued throughout the summer, but Kefauver resigned his position, possibly out of exhaustion, but maybe because he sensed he was testing the patience of the Truman White House. The committee produced an 11,000 page report, drew back the curtain on organized crime for the first time for many Americans. The term Capo del Capi, the boss of bosses or godfather was first introduced to the public memory at these hearings. They revealed extensive evidence of organized crime's influence on business and politics, although they also found that most of the organization was focused locally or regionally and less nationally. Although the report recommended a number of avenues for legislation, almost all of the legislative recommendations of the final report went unanswered. And the FBI, led by J. Edgar Hoover, remained more focused on communism than on organized crime for some time. Until in 1957, when the bust of dozens of mafia bosses at the Appalachian Summit forced Hoover to deal with the threat seriously. However, it did inspire further investigations. The defeat of several gambling referenda across the country and more than 70 crime commissions were established to deal with the problem at the state and local level. The hearings made Estes Kefauver a national celebrity, he appeared on television shows. In December, he was voted one of the 10 most admired men, putting him right up there with Albert Einstein, Pope Pius XII, and Douglas MacArthur. He leveraged that fame into two presidential runs in 1952 and 1956, and in 1960 was Adlai Stevenson's running mate against the Republicans Dwight Eisenhower and Richard Nixon. One of the more negative effects of the committee hearings was it gave Americans the impression that mob activity in America was the result primarily of the Italian-American mafia, which is still kind of part of the public perception of a mobster, but in reality, many ethnic groups and other groups were involved in organized crime. The committee's connection to television is also important. It reinforced the value of television news and the power of a visual medium like television over a media like print and radio. It inspired crime exposés and a wave of fiction from Hollywood. And Estes Kefauver even appeared bookending a mob film one against the dangers of organized crime. More than perhaps any other event, the Kefauver Committee brought organized crime into the American consciousness. Mob history like this and many other stories and artifacts are stored in Las Vegas in the historic former US post office and courthouse. Now the Mob Museum, the very building where the Kefauver Committee held its hearings in the city. The courtroom has been restored. You can see where the committee questioned mob associates such as Mo Sedway, Wilbur Clark, and Nevada Lieutenant Governor Cliff Jones. Every year, the Mob Museum celebrates November 15th as Kefauver Day. You can learn more at themobmuseum.org. I hope you enjoyed this episode of the History Guys, where it's snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy it, please go. So you can kind of see the impact that that had. By the way, the other videos of the history are, are equally good and compelling. But I think he puts it in, 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 a, in a light that, that's a lot more interesting than, than hearing me drone on at, you know, seven something in the morning on a Monday morning. So hopefully that, that helps. But the Kefauver hearings did spawn other hearings. Uh, one of them was the McClellan hearings uh, into labor rackets and organized crimes influence into labor rackets. So let's take a quick look at that hearing as well, or at least a piece of that hearing. And then we'll kind of tie it together. Hopefully this works. If communist unions ever gain a position to exercise influence in the transport lanes of the world, the free world will have suffered a staggering blow. I am not interested in Beck's politics or philosophy. I'm interested in the workers. Well, do you agree with that? No, I don't agree with it because the American worker will never put anybody at the head of unions. That will disrupt the American uh, system. Well, do you know who made that statement? I don't know and I don't care. Probably Beck would sound like him. Mr. James Riddle Hoff. I don't believe it. What do you think of that? While leaving the hearings after these people had testified regarding this matter, did you say that SOB, I'll break his back? Who? You. After to who? To anyone. Did you make that statement? Well, whose back were you going to break, Mr. Hoffa? Thank you for your speech. I don't even know who I was talking about, and I don't know what you're talking about. You had, know been, you had been You had been in business uh, with Mr. Matheson, had you not? With my own money. But you had been in business. With my own money, yes. Uh, do you have any evidence of the $20,000 in cash that you put into the business? I don't need any evidence. You'll take my word for it as the Internal Revenue has. Can you describe a little of it there, Mr. Hoffman? No, sir, I cannot, and I don't Tell care to. 
I don't care to try and recall back my entire lifetime since I started working at the age 17 as to how I accumulated money or how I spent it to finally arrive at having $20,000 I could afford to invest and finally lost. Did you answer? Was it in cash that you put it in? Yes. Was there, do you have any record of it? No. Did you tell us where you got the cash? I accumulated it. From your uh, salary? From whatever investments I had, or salary or income, did but any it was of, accumulated. Did any of this come out of the winnings that uh, Mr. It Brennan made at the racetrack? Have, very easily it could have. Could I ask you whether Mr. Brennan is still winning at the track? I believe he is. I hope we have luck this year. We haven't finished yet. How much have you turned over to him to gamble? So far this year, nothing. You kept me too busy. How much has he uh, won for you? <laughs> How much has he won for you? None this moment? Year. I haven't, been in, I haven't been in the question of, of the trying to gain, make any money in horse racing this year yet. Been too busy. But in other words, as I understood it, he had won sixty-four thousand dollars in cash. Well, that's not hard to believe. That's in up till fifty-seven. <laughs> Go out to the track. Now, what about since fifty-seven? How much has he won in cash for you since then? I don't know. I don't have the records. You've been in the track with him. Oh, I go maybe once a year, once every three years. But he usually goes. That's right. You give him the money. That's right. And he bets I where did. he wants I it. I haven't this year. I see. Well, now you could. You, this I don't believe I did last year, by the way, either. It's pretty busy here, too. No, that's right. And it's possible that this $20,000 might have come out of the money that Bert Brennan won for you at the race. Conceivably. Drive. But you couldn't tell us any other sort. I have no rec I have no basic figures of income per day, per week, or where it came from. I file my internal revenue report. I'm sure they check it. Could you ask? It? So could you far tell as us? I know of, they haven't contended it. Could you tell us what? Uh, would you feel that it was in uh, an unreasonable question if we asked you how much cash you have now? I wouldn't answer it. You wouldn't care to answer. No. It. You wouldn't care to tell us the sources of it either, no. would you? <laughs> I've never been completely convinced, Mr. Hoffer, to be frank with you, that uh, Mr. Brennan did win this money at the racetrack. Why don't you ask him? Yeah, I did, and he took the Fifth Amendment. Well, maybe he has a reason to, Mr. I Kennedy. Think, I think he might have a reason, but you suggested we ask Mr. Brennan. Mr. Brennan then took the Fifth Amendment when he was asked the question, and I've never considered either that that was a satisfactory explanation of the cash that you had, or that these numerous several people, such as business agents, who themselves had to borrow money in order to survive, that they loaned you $2,000 in cash without any note and without interest. Thank you for reviewing the testimony. So what you see there is, this is the McClellan hearings. The witness is Jimmy Hoffa, and the person doing the questioning is counsel to the McClellan hearing, the McClellan committee, and that's Robert F. Kennedy. You can kind of see there's some tension there, right? They're, they're, they're locking horns. They're, they're <laughs> you know, uh, Bobby Kennedy is, trying to find the source of funds for Jimmy Hoffa's wealth. Jimmy Hoffa is, you know, being evasive and, uh, you know, is pointing to winnings at, at horse racing tracks, um, you know, for money he gave to somebody else and that somebody else has pled the fifth and won't, won't testify before the committee uh, in any meaningful way. And, you, you can see the tension. And again, this was also a televised hearing. So the 60s come in, you know, those hearings were in the 50s. And in 1960, John F. Kennedy wins the presidential election, the national election. In 1961, Eisenhower ends relations with Cuba you know, addressing the communism issue and addressing some of the gambling issues. Because if you looked at those charts and things uh, from the, the uh, Kefauver hearings, Cuba is, you know, constantly in the, the flow charts because organized crime, people had investments in, in Cuban resorts. So January 3rd, Eisenhower ends relations with Cuba. January 20th, John F. Kennedy is sworn in as the 35th president of the United States. The very next day, Robert F. Kennedy is confirmed as the U.S. Attorney General. Less than five months later, RFK is testified before the House Committee on the Judiciary, and he calls for the enactment of the Wire Act, the Federal Wire Act. So you can kind of see where this comes from. 
the motivation behind it, the champion of it is somebody that has had a long and uh, uh, and and difficult uh, relationship <laughs> with with organized crime figures, and we end up with the Wire Act as we know it today. So what does the Wire Act actually say? Well, there are two primary portions of the Wire Act, and we'll go through this slowly today. And again, don't want to put too much on you. I know it's early morning, the after the Super Bowl, but it says whoever being in the whoever being engaged in the business of betting or wagering knowingly uses a wire communication facility for the transmission and in interstate or foreign commerce of bets or wagers or information assisting in the placement placing of bets or wagers on any sporting event or contest, or for the transmission of wire communication that entitles a recipient to receive money or credit as a result of bets or wagers, or for information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers, and then it says shall be fined or imprisoned, okay? So let's just take a look at that first piece. Whoever being in the business of betting or wagering. So clearly this is a supply side law. And what you're going to see with federal laws is they are all supply side. So let's get that out there right away. Knowingly uses a wire communication facility for the transmission of interstate or foreign commerce. So you have to know that you're using wire communications, some electronic communication. By the way, wire communication is generally defined as anything that can and be regulated by the FCC. We'll go into that definition Wednesday. Of bets or wagers or information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers on any sporting event or contest. This is language that has become somewhat controversial or at least debatable. And we'll go over that later. And then we have these last two Prohibition. So you have that comma or, and then for the transmission of a wire communication that entitles recipient to receive money or credit as a result of bets or wagers. And then we have information assisting again. But this time, no reference to sporting event or, or contest. You kind of, kind of see that? So in sort of that peach section, you have of bets or wagers or information assisting in a placement of bets or wagers on any sporting order contest. And then in this uh, kind of gray, again, that last, you again have information assisting in the placement of bets or wagers, but no sporting event or contest modifier. And that'll become a point of issue later on as we go through materials, not today, but later. So let's talk about this first piece. What do you think the business of betting or wagering means? Open for discussion. If we're up to you, what would you, your prosecutor, what do you think that means? It's not defined. Alex. I mean, would it be, I could imagine it being, you know, ranging from someone who's actually like accepting bets and wagering themselves versus, and then also someone who sort of has a lesser role in that, maybe just like facilitating that perhaps in some way or marketing it in some way. I could see kind of all those being encompassed under this potentially. Yeah, I think that's, that's fair. It's one way to look at it. Any other thoughts? I know you just talked about how this is like aimed at supply side, but I'm wondering if it's like anyone who's engaged. So anyone who goes and like seeks out a bookie to help them place a wager or bet might be like included yeah. in this, whoever being engaged in the business of betting or wagering. I think, you know, if you're placing bets, you're probably not covered by this, but if you're an intermediary, 
So you might be taking or pooling bets to place with a bookmaker. You're a bet runner. Yeah, probably. In Nevada, we have we have a, a statutory prohibition on that of uh, placing bets for others for a fee. So I think, yeah, both those things would, would cut it. The only thing it really doesn't cover are the betters themselves. So if you're on the supply side, there's a good chance. Let's just go through one court opinion. We'll keep it simple today. We'll go through one court opinion. You know, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> um, so let's take a look at the Barborian opinion. Anybody remember the facts of this one? Here you have a better and a bookmaker that get charged under the Wire Act. You have Barborian who was placing bets with a known booker, bookmaker named Laurel. Laurel. Uh, Barborian is betting anywhere from $800 to $1,000 a day. You can kind of triple that for today's money. It's a lot of money. This guy is a definitely a degenerate gambler. Um, they have at least eight calls that were intercepted in which Barborian is placing bets with Laurel. And at least once, Barborian called his dad to get a bet placed on his behalf. So what's the major issue? The major issue is whether Barborian is considered to be in the business of betting or wagering based on his activities. So, you know, what are the arguments that he is involved? Alex. I mean, I guess if you think about you know, how a business can function and operate, like without people like him placing <laughs> bets and facilitating, there would be no business of betting and wagering. Yeah. You know, he's a professional gambler, essentially. He's betting, you know, today's money anywhere from, you know, 3000 to $4,000 per day. That adds up in a, lot, in a hurry. And on top of that, he takes what are called layoff wagers. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. She's so what does the court do? Does it look at the plain language of the statute? It does. And then it also starts looking at the legislative history a little bit. That's where it goes for guidance. It looks for context. And again, you saw the context. And in the reading materials, and we'll talk about this next class, you see RFK's memorandum regarding the Federal Wire Act. And that's an important piece of, of, of history to, to, to read uh, in addition to reading the statute. But the court does recognize that Barborian is a professional gambler. But, you know, the court doesn't think the statute applies to professional gamblers. Again, the Federal Wire Act was put in place. You kind of saw that history, organized crime, organized crime funding, organized crime activities. It's going after the supply side. It's going after, at this point in time, those involved in organized crime for an activity that they use to generate revenue. And being a professional gambler, is not being part of organized crime. It's not being part of the supply side. So the court doesn't see him as, or a professional gambler, as someone that's, that's encompassed by the prohibitions in the act. So what about bets between friends regarding their opinions on the outcome of a sporting event? What does the court think about that? 
and friends that bet each other on uh, the outcome of the Super Bowl. We go to a Super Bowl party, you know, I'm from Ohio, and, and I'm talking sh- uh, uh, stuff, and folks from California want to, you know, want me to put my money where my mouth is. Alex. I mean, it definitely seems like that was not intended to be within the scope of statute at all. Um, I think especially because they mentioned like with the Wire Act, it's really about the the use of like this interstate communication for the transmission versus just the mere transmission of bets and wagers. So I think even especially given that it would fall outside the scope of the statute. Yeah, this doesn't reach that. And then what's a layoff bet? I'll show you. So yesterday we had this game. Uh, Forget the thousand dollar thing. So the Rams are favored by four points yesterday, but they're playing in their home field. They've got an all-star team, literally an all-star team. They went out and bought a team. (laughs) Uh, What they, you know, their, their philosophy has been win now, pay later. And so they picked up, you know, players like Von Miller, uh, Matthew Stafford, Odell Beckham Jr., all kind of all-star type players, and they've paid a fortune for them. So they've got, you know, arguably a, a, the strongest roster in football because they went out and hired the best talent they possibly could. Bengals have drafted well, and they've drafted well because – They've been the worst team in football or one of the worst teams in football for the better part of two decades. So they're kind of homegrown. Rams have won a Super Bowl before. Rams are playing in their home field. Bengals have never won a Super Bowl. They've been there twice before and got blown out both times. But they haven't been back there since the 80s. And most of you weren't even a thought. Back in the 80s. Um, I was around, but uh, but you know, clearly the betting lines think you know are favoring LA. So you get a bookmaker in Los Angeles, home of the Rams, and he's taking wagers on this game, and he ends up taking half a million dollars in the Rams and five hundred dollars on the Bengals. What's the problem for the bookmaker? If the Rams cover, he's sunk. If the Rams cover, you know, you've seen those movies, what happens to bookies that don't pay? Take your thumbs. Exactly. He's got big problems. You know, he's, you know, excluding the VIG, you know, he's he's almost a half million dollars shy if the, if the Rams win and cover. It's a big problem for the bookmaker in L.A. Conversely, let's say there's a bookmaker in Cincinnati. He's been taking bets on this. He's got the opposite problem. He's taking 300,000 on the Bengals and about 500 on the Rams. It's got a similar problem, right? Now, nobody's ever going to be perfectly balanced. You're never going to have 100,000 on the Rams, 100,000 on the Bengals, where you're just shifting money and keeping a service fee or VIG. Everybody know how sports betting works, the VIG? No? I'll explain it now. I don't have slides for it. So let's say you wanted to place a hundred dollar bet on this game yesterday here in Las Vegas and you're betting against the spread. So if you bet, let's say on the Rams and you bet a hundred dollars, you actually have to put down 110. The extra $10 is a 10% service fee or vigorous. If you win your bet, you get the service fee back. So if you bet the Rams and you got them at 
two and a half, for example, yesterday, and you bet a hundred, you bet a hundred dollars, you gave 110, you would get $210 back. Your 110 that you, you bet plus the hundred that you won. Make sense? Conversely, if you bet the Bengals at that same two and a half line, the Bengals didn't cover, they lost by three, you would lose your entire 110. That extra $10 on the losing bets, that's called the vigorish or the service fee or the comparita, whatever you want to call it. But that's the advantage that the bookmaker has. It's not a huge advantage, by the way. So the, the bookmaker takes about 10% on losing bets only. So again, this bookmaker's got a problem in Cincinnati. Well, they both have a problem. It's a similar problem. Now, most bookmakers have what they call a risk profile because you're never really going to be balanced. But he may say, you know what? I've, been, I've done really well this year. You know, uh, a lot of favorites won. I did all right. Um, and I haven't lost a lot. I'm willing to go 200,000 in exposure. So, but he finds out, hey, there's this bookmaker in Cincinnati that's got next to $300,000 worth of exposure. So what that LA bookmaker is going to do is he's going to place a $300,000 wager with the Cincinnati bookmaker. So now the Cincinnati bookmaker is pretty close to even. And that LA bookmaker has gotten $300,000 closer to even. Essentially that LA bookmaker has laid off his risk with the Cincinnati bookmaker if he does this. And conversely, the Cincinnati bookmaker has laid off his risk. Right, because he's way out on Cincinnati. And when these bookmakers lay off that risk by placing bets with one another, that's called a layoff wager. Does that make sense? So you do have layoff wagering. Layoff wagering does occur in Nevada's regulations. We permit layoff wagering. But you know, because of the Federal Wire Act, as we'll see, we only permit layoff wagering on an intrastate basis with licensed bookmakers. This does not happen often unless the bookmakers are owned by the same company. Uh, there are, in Nevada, there are operators with multiple properties that will operate each book under a separate license. And back, like, for example, back in the 80s, the northern part of the state was really Niners country. Southern part of the state was Raiders country. And you may have a Raiders Niners game uh, where your book up north may, you know, be heavy on the, the, the Niners and your book down south might be heavy on the Raiders. And as a company, you can make your own layoff wager between your two books to kind of level things out so that each property wouldn't be as exposed. But it doesn't happen often. You know, it, it, again, if, you know, if William Hill was way out of line on one line, or I should say Caesars, and, you know, stations could absorb some of that, you know, stations isn't going to take the wager or better yet, Boyden stations, big competitors, right? You know, they're gonna say, good luck with that. <laughs> so but this is what a layoff wager is. So with Barborian, Barborian takes layoff wagers, but he does it in a different way. So let's say Lauro is taken, you know, too many bets on the Bengals. He's taking a lot of dog bets. And he's 200,000 in the hole on the Bengals if the Bengals cover. So he calls Lauro or he calls up Barbori and says, you know, you know, you wanted to make a bet on the Rams? What if I 
sweeten the deal a little bit. And I move the line for you. I'm sorry, Laura was going to take the, the, the Bengals at, you know, four. He says, what if I move the line a little bit for you and I get you to take the Bengals at six? But you got to place $150,000 down. And he might do that, right? If he can get a better line, helps the bookmaker out. The bookmaker's getting closer and balanced. Although in this case, wouldn't have worked out so well for the bookmaker. But that's what's going on with Barborian and Laurel. If Barborian gets, if uh, Laurel gets too far out on a game and Barborian calls the place a bet, what Laurel is doing is he's making it a little bit sweeter for Barborian to switch his wager to the other side, which then helps Laurel balance his book or get closer to balance. Does that make sense? And so that's how he's laying off his risk with his professional degenerate gambling customer. So the court says, no, in this case, that's not, that's not your typical layoff wager. And of course the government is arguing that layoff wagers by their nature have to be made between bookmakers which means Barborian's a bookmaker. The court says, no, that's not the case. Here, Barborian is just being a better consumer. He's getting a better line. He's getting, you know, maybe instead of a better line, maybe uh, Laurel says, you know what? I won't charge you the service fee if you lose. It's 10% on your bet that you're not going to lose. Great. I'll take that. And it helps him balance the line, balance his books. Um, so with the court looking at it, what does it mean? What does it define being in the best business of betting or wagering to be? Must there be a, some kind of a sale of a product or service? Well, let's take a look at these questions and then we'll take a look at what the court said. You know, do you have to have uh, provided an essential function or can merely occasional providing occasional non-essential services qualify? Well, here the court pretty well explains it. They said being, a, being engaged in the business of betting or wager requires the sale of a product or service for a fee involving third parties. The customer and the clients or the performance of a function which is an integral part of such business. The defendant need not be exclusively engaged in such business. If he is not an agent or employee of the business, he need not share in the profits or losses of the business or receive compensation for the services. But the function he performs must provide a regular and essential contribution to the overall operation of the business. If an individual performs only a occasional or non-essential service, or is merely a better or customer, regardless of the amount bet, he cannot be said to be engaged in the business. There must be some continuing course of conduct. And if an association, the joint conduct must be to achieve a common purpose or objective. So Barborian kind of lays out this opinion lays out what it means to be in the business of betting or wagering, that first part of the wire act. So again, providing some integral or essential function to contribute to the overall business, other than being a customer or a better. And you don't even have to get paid. So is Barborian in the business of betting or wagering? He is a professional gambler. He, you know, is betting more than, you know, the prosecutors are making in a month at that point in time. Even though those prosecutors went to law school and are reasonably smart, they don't have 
thousand dollars a day to blow on gambling. But he is not in the business of betting or wagering. He is in the business of being a degenerate gambler, a professional gambler. Uh, you know, he, he bets on everything. But he's not in the business of betting or wagering. So let's let's talk about some examples. 